Hi, everyone, and welcome to our virtual health event with UC Health. My name is Hannah Peretz, and I'm an event coordinator here with the Highlands Ranch Community Association. And we are so excited that you took the time out of your evenings, the snowy evenings tonight, to join us to discuss colon health. We are grateful for UC Health Highlands Ranch Hospital as a community partner and happy to host this wonderful event with their assistance. Before we get started, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. During the webinar, your microphones will be muted. To ask questions, please type them into the Q&A chat box located on the bottom of your screen. We will save the questions for the Q&A portion towards the end of the event. Our presenter this evening is Dr. V. And now without further ado, I wanna pass the baton off to Dr. V. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Pujita Valasa Reddy. I'm one of the medical oncologists and hematologists at Highlands Ranch, um, UC Health. Um, today, we'll be talking a little bit about colon cancer, colorectal cancer, actually, and we'll majorly talk about prevention and um, screening, what methods of screening we have available now, and um, what's good screening um, and um, we'll talk a little bit about the stages of colon cancer, et cetera. So let's get started. Okay, some of the stats for colon cancer. For the CDC, colorectal cancer is the third most frequently diagnosed cancer in the United States. It's also the third leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the United States. An individual's risk of getting cancer of the colon or the rectum increases with advancing age. The likelihood of cancer diagnosis increases after the age of 40 and rises progressively after the age of 50. In the United States, median age at diagnosis is of colon cancer is 68 in men and 72 in women. Median age at diagnosis for rectal cancer is 63 years old for men and women. So what is colon cancer? What is colorectal cancer? So cancer cells are just uncontrolled abnormal cell growth, which starts in the colon or the rectum. These abnormal cell growths can form a mass or, or form a mass of tissue. Usually these begin as a non-cancerous polyp that can over time become a cancerous tumor. What is a polyp? A polyp is a small growth where it's where it shouldn't be. Most colon polyps are harmless, but over time, some polyps can turn into colon cancer, which can be fatal if found in a late stage. And I'll show you some pictures of what a polyp looks like. Um, so this is what your um, digestive system looks like. This would be your stomach, small intestine, and then the large intestine, and then the rectum and the anus. So a polyp is typically, like we discussed, is an abnormal growth in your colon or the rectum. So this abnormal polyp can be on a stalk and look like this, or just be inside the colon like this. This is an actual picture of what a colonic polyp looks like when he has a little stalk attached to it. So a polyp, it's, polyp is a, as we discussed, is an abnormal growth, and, but it's an, also an opportunity for intervention. It's important to remember that majority of the polyps take a very long time to grow, approximately about 10 years from when cells turn into polyps to when they become cancerous. This allows us for an opportunity to find them early through screening. Most polyps remain benign or non-cancerous and are often termed hyperplastic polyps. The likelihood that these hyperplastic polyps become cancerous is very low. There are other precancerous polyps called adenomas. Adenomas are polyps that grow on a stalk, like we discussed before, like small mushrooms. They tend to grow over a decade or more. The risk of an adenoma becoming cancerous increases as the size increases and the longer it is in your colon. Um, so this, this, it's important that we pick these up early with a colonoscopy or some form of screening test so we can remove them so they don't turn into colorectal cancer. When they, when they become large and invade into the colon and spread to other tissues in your body, that's when they become dangerous and um, malignant. So this is another little um, diagram about how um, they start and what they become. So I'll just 
it starts as cell growth, abnormal cell growth, and it's very small in the beginning. Then it becomes a little larger, and these are called polyps. This is a small polyp, and this is a big polyp. And then they become precancerous and look even bigger. And when they become cancerous, they're called adenocarcinoma. And this is cancer. And then when it becomes really dangerous is when it invades into the colonic mucosa and spreads to other other areas around the colon or other organs in your body, like your, like your lungs, like your liver, like your lymph nodes, anything else that becomes invasive cancer. It's dangerous when it, when you catch it early in these phases and remove them, it's very easy to treat when they become this or this, it becomes very hard to treat. So you want the idea is to catch them when they're in early stages, like such as this. These are real pictures of colonic polyps um, with, uh, when seen through a colonoscopy. This is what a normal colon looks like. And this is a giant polyp, more polyps, just these are smaller polyps. This is when you have a, a, a condition called um, FAP, where you're genetically prone to having many, many, many polyps. Um, and this is what that looks like. It's a flat polyp, pedunculated. It's polyp just means it's on a stalk. And like I said, this is a normal colon. So just to show you what the polyps look like. So risk factors for colon cancer. What is a risk factor? Anything that affects your chance of getting a disease such as cancer is called a risk factor. There are many different risk factors. Each different cancer has different risk factors. It, what a risk factor does is increases your chance of getting that type of cancer. So some of the risk factors for colon cancer, um, some lifestyle factors are diet, um, high in red meats and processed meats, cooking meats at a very high temperature like frying, broiling, or grilling, um, physical inactivity, obesity, smoking, heavy alcohol use, and low vitamin D levels are all associated with um, increased risk of getting colon cancer. Some other risk factor as we age, our risk becomes more, especially after the age of 45 to 50. If you've had a personal history of colon cancer or polyps, then you have a higher risk of developing more polyps uh, and, an, and a secondary colon cancer. Personal history of inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And if you have a family history of colorectal cancer or polyps, you're, you, it puts you at a higher risk. Inherited syndromes, I'll mention some of those in the next slide. Certain racial and ethnic groups have a higher risk of getting colon cancer and type two diabetes also puts you at a little bit higher risk for colon cancer. So the genetic syndromes that, that predispose you to colorectal cancer, one major syndrome is called Lynch syndrome. It runs in families. So if you have this, you're very high risk of colorectal cancer. And there are other polyposis syndromes classical FAP, attenuated FAP, and there's some other mutations that are associated with it, Pugh-Jager Pugh syndrome, Cowden syndrome, leaf Romani syndrome, these also puts you at a high risk for breast cancer. So if any of these run in your family, then it puts you at a high risk for um, getting colon cancer over your lifetime, increases your lifetime risk. So signs and symptoms. So it's very important to rem remember that early colon cancer, early stage colon cancer at a polyp level or very small uh, cancers, a tumor, you may not have any symptoms. So that's very important to remember. Usually people get symptoms when the tumor is big enough to cause problems. So some of the symptoms that people experience is change in bowel habits. When you're regular typically and you get either constipated or you get diarrhea or the caliber of your stool changes for some reason, and it's consistently changed uh, over, over time, then something's going on. That's one of the signs. And the feeling that you have to have a bowel movement all the time, but you, when you actually go, you can't really have a bowel movement. That's another sign. Rectal bleeding. One of the major things we see these days um, before we diagnose colon cancer is iron deficiency anemia no cause. Our Western diet is rich in iron. So if you're iron deficient without a major cause, then it's concerning for um, something going on in your colon. Rectal bleeding, obviously blood and stool, dark stool as well, which dark stool just means that there's blood in it. Or if you have abdominal pain, cramping for no great reason for days at a time, weakness, fatigue, weight loss, unintentional weight loss, all of these are signs and symptoms. Again, early, if, if it's early stage or early colon cancer, 
you may not have any symptoms at all. So why screening for colon cancer is very, very important because colon cancer is preventable. So how do we do that? We, we need to obtain colon cancer screenings regularly. Any, find any polyps that are early growth that we talked about earlier and remove them. Once you remove the polyp, the polyp doesn't have a chance to grow and invade into the colonic tissue and become cancerous and spread. So, and that's how you prevent colon cancer from finding it really early and treating it by removing it. So who should be screened? So until a few years ago, the recommendation was for a patient, for people above the age of 50 to be screened. But now um, younger and younger people are getting colon cancer. We think it's from dietary changes and um, obesity and um, just you know, eating more red meats, et cetera. For a ver various variety of reasons, we think colon cancer, younger and younger people are getting colon cancer now. So um, nationally, we've decided that colon cancer screening should be done now starting at the age of 45 instead of 50. So that's very important to remember, if you're above the age of 45, you need to discuss it with your primary care to order a um, screening colonoscopy. So all people, if you're at average risk, no high risk factors, like no family history of colon cancer or don't have any ulcerative colitis, the risk factors we talked about, if you don't have any of that, if you're average risk, then the recommendations now are to be screened at the age of 45 and above. If you reach the age of 75, um, then in the, typically if you're average risk, we stop screening at 75. But if you're high risk, then it's determined by your doctors if you need to continue screening after the age of 75. The recommendation for 45 and above is, includes men and women, everybody um, nationally. So who are people that are at high risk? As we discussed, you know, people that have personal history of prior cancer, personal his a family history of polyps or ulcerative colitis, they should be screened more often and there are guidelines for every each different type of uh, risk factor. And those guidelines are completely different. The 45 and above is for just average risk um, people. So colon cancer screenings have gotten kind of complicated because we have a variety of tests that we can do now for screening purposes. So to divide them into two main categories, one category is stool-based testing. Um, we send you a, a test and you um, take some stool and you send it back to us when we test that for um, signs of cancer. The second is doing some sort of a procedure like a colonoscopy and sigmoidoscopy. Are they equal? Um, are they equally good at screening? And I'll show you that in the next slide. They're not. The best test is a colonoscopy, not only because the sensitivity is uh, high for colonoscopy, it's also that, for example, if there's something abnormal that we see on a colonoscopy, we can intervene. For example, if we see a polyp, we can remove it. You can't do that for a stool-based test. So if the stool-based test is done and we see that it's abnormal, we'll send you for a colonoscopy anyway. So uh, because of that, the best test we think is a colonoscopy. So some of the there, some of the stool-based tests are called fit testing, but if you if you do the fit testing or stool-based testing, they need to be done every year. There's another thing called a stool DNA test. If you guys have heard of Colon Guard, which is approved um, in 2014, so it's a stool DNA test. It tests for some DNA, um, uh, some genetic genetic uh, tests, and it also tests from blood and stool. That Colon Guard has become really popular. But even with that, if you have a colagard done, it's every three years. But if you have that done and it's abnormal, we still have to get a colonoscopy. Colonoscopy, as you guys already know, is the best test. Essentially, it's done by a gastroenterologist. And um, typically, if it's clean, we do it every 10 years. Um, and if there are multiple polyps, we decide whether you need to be screened again in three years, five years, depending on how many polyps, how big they are, how dangerous they are, et cetera. Um, and for a colonoscopy, um, we do a prep where, you know, we want the colon to be as clean as possible before we do it. So we can see the colon because it's usually filled with stool and uh, debris. So we want to clean that out. So there's a prep that you have to do uh, for a day before the colonoscopy. That can be a little cumbersome, um, but that's the best way to look at it. And sigmoidoscopy is similar to a colonoscopy, but it doesn't go through the entire um, colon, just looks in the 
in one part of the phone. So that's why we have to do it more often. There's one test on here, which we don't do um, as often. Um, it's called a CT colonography and um, it's a virtual colonoscopy. You still have to do a stool, a, a prep where you have to clean out your bowel the day before, but instead of putting a colonoscopy throat, it's virtual. We typically don't do that. Um, typically what's recommended is a colonoscopy. Um, again, because oh, the next slide. So as you can see, set, so these are all the different types of uh, testing, like a colonox, colonoscopy, a sigmoidoscopy, CD colonography, which is a virtual colonoscopy, and um, fit testing um, and DNA testing, which is the whole work. So as you can see here, sensitivity, these are the sensitivities for each of these tests. And what is sensitivity is, what, the best way to explain it is if you have cancer, um, what's the chance that this test will tell you that you have cancer, right? The higher sensitivity, the more likely that if you have cancer, that test will pick up the cancer because you don't wanna do a screening test that um, tells you don't have cancer when you actually do have cancer, right? So the higher the sensitivity, the better a test is. So colonoscopy overall has the best sensitivity. And um, the re that's one of the reasons we recommend it. Again, the, uh, the second reason is if anything is abnormal, then we have a chance to intervene. For example, if you do any of the remainder of the tests and it shows that it's abnormal, we have to recommend a colonoscopy anyway. Um, yeah, this is just some data. And, and as you can see, the intervals are different for each of these testing. We do a colonoscopy, it's every 10 years. If you do stool-based testing, it's annually, usually fit testing where we just look for blood in your stool. Um, you just, you know, we send you a test and you rub, you know, we ask you to send some stool sample. They, it can essentially check for blood in your stool. So if you do any of those tests, then you have to do it annually every year. And then the, um, the, the DNA testing is every three years, which is your Colaguard, but that we can do um, also non-invasive. So colon cancer screening saves lives. Um, I got this graph and it's very interesting because it's from a CDC website. So it's essentially tracked all the new cases of colorectal cancer starting in 1999 and traced it all the way to 20, uh, 2018. Um, so essentially what this is telling us is off Every colon cancer that was diagnosed, this is out of 100,000 people back in 1999, about 58 people out of 100,000 were diagnosed with colorectal cancer. Over time, this dropped to, in 2018, only about 38-ish patients were diagnosed out of 100,000 people with colon cancer and rectal cancer. This is because of screening. We became very vigilant with screening over time and were able to pick up more patients with colon cancer, early colon cancer, and cure them. And this is this, this is a trend which is very interesting to see. So prevention, like what can you do to prevent um, risk increase to prevent or decrease your risk for getting colon cancer? So lifestyle modifications, as we discussed earlier, people are getting colon cancer earlier and earlier in their life. We think it's because of dietary changes, et cetera. So what can you do to fix that or help prevent yourself from getting colon cancer? Physical activity. It's shown there's data saying that inactivity increases your risk for colorectal cancer. And intake of more fruits and vegetables and less red meat has shown to be beneficial. Quitting smoking and alcohol cessation has shown to be beneficial in preventing colon cancer. And the second thing I wanted to touch base on is aspirin. There is um, substantial evidence about protective effect of aspirin for colorectal cancer when taken for five to 10 years. The US Preventive Services Task Force endorses low dose aspirin, which is 81 milligrams. Um, low dose aspirin intake for individuals between the age of 45 to 59 with greater than 10% cardiovascular risk for the purposes of lowering both heart disease as well as colorectal um, cancer risk. This is something that's very individualized and you'll need to talk to your primary care, whether you're a good candidate for aspirin, depending on your bleeding risk, depending on your cardiovascular risk, it's shown to decrease um, colorectal cancer risk. So I put this slide in, not to confuse anyone, but just to kind of touch base on 
uh, kind of stages of colon cancer. It's important because we treat colon cancer differently based on your stage of colon cancer. Stage zero means that um, cancer cells are found only in the innermost lining of the colon and not spread anywhere. That's the best, um, or you don't wanna have colon cancer, but stage zero is the best deal of all the other stages. Stage four obviously is the worst. So stage one, um, this tumor hasn't gone beyond the inner layer of the, um, of the colon. And stage two means it's gone, uh, it has grown outside the colon, but has not spread to the lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are all over your body. They drain your, um, all your organs. They're in your neck. They're, there are hundreds of them. So cancer spreads first to the lymph nodes and then goes to other organs in your body. So stage three is when colon cancer spread to the lymph nodes. And stage four means that it's gone from a localized situation to elsewhere in your body. Anywhere else it goes other than the colon and the lymph nodes, it's called stage four. When colon cancer goes into your lungs or your liver, that becomes stage four. So what, treat, what are the treatments for colon cancer is if you're early stage, early stage colon cancer, surgery, we just surgerize you and we remove the colon cancer and that's it. Um, no chemotherapy, no radiation therapy. As the stages grow, we incorporate chemotherapy as well as radiation therapy. The more aggressive the cancer is, the higher stage it is. So we, we have to incorporate chemotherapy to um, prevent can cancer recurrence and radiation therapy uh, majority of the time in later stages of your cancer, mainly stage four, we incorporate radiation therapy as well. So as you can see, because it's so complicated to treat colon cancer, we prefer, we, we prevent that way before it becomes cancerous. And the, the way you can do that is with screening. So once somebody has colon cancer, it requires a multidisciplinary approach. What that means is that um, set of doctors, a surgeon, a, a medical oncologist, a radiation oncologist, a pathologist, a dietitian, a genetic counselor, all of these people have to be involved in taking care of somebody who has colon cancer. So we call these clinics multidisciplinary clinics. Um, and we have one of those in, uh, at UC Health and in Highland Stretch. And it's, very, it's run very smoothly. Um, and we bring um, a colon cancer patient in and all the doctors see the patient on the same day. And then after we see them, we discuss them as a group, come up with a plan. And um, there's a dietitian, genetic counselor, if um, you know, a, a like there's a family history, et cetera, and we make a plan for that patient. Um, yeah. And that's all I have um, as far as screening and prevention. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can ask in the little chat box, or um, that's my email address. I'm happy to answer any questions um, through email as well. Great, thank you, Dr. V. And yes, as she said, we'll now go ahead and take some questions. So please feel free to put some questions into the chat. Just a reminder that the chat box is located on the bottom of your screen. And we do have a few questions already. Um, the first question is, what long-term side effects or late effects are possible based on cancer treatment? That's a very good question. So, as we discussed a little bit, um, so the colon cancer is treated differently based on your stage. So early stage, namely stage one and lower risk stage two cancers are just resected um, or just um, surgically removed, right? That portion of your colon is removed surgically and the, the healthy colon is attached. Um, and, you know, sometimes surgery can cause like a scar, scar tissue or the change in bowel habits because you have a part of your colon that's missing. So surgery has those kind of side effects to where your bowel habits can change, you can form scar tissue, um, et cetera. And then chemotherapy, for example, I'm a chemotherapy doctor, I'm a medical oncologist, so I'm the one who gives chemotherapy. Chemotherapy for colon cancer has many, 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 many different chemotherapy options, but all of them can cause nausea, weight loss, um, long-term residual effects. Some of the treatments can cause peripheral neuropathy, which is numbness and tingling in your feet. 
um, weight loss, like I said, uh, yeah, anemia. Sometimes during treatments, you can get anemic where to where you, you may need blood transfusions, et cetera. And then uh, radiation comes really in the later stages um, of your cancer, like stage four, typically we can radiate some, some things that are stage four. Like if, if the cancer is gone to your liver, we can do local therapies with radiation, et cetera. Those can also cause local uh, like skin inflammation or skin um, redness, everything we call it redness and inflammation of the, the site where we radiate, et cetera. But you do have some long-term uh, chemotherapy effects um, such as neuropathy in your fingertips, some, um, some organ damage sometimes and kidney issues because sometimes the chemotherapy is cleared by your kidneys or your liver. So those can be permanent sometimes as well. So depending on what chemo you choose, there's multiple different things that can be um, long-term. Great, thank you. And then next question, what is a tortuous colon and is it a concern? A tortuous colon is something that's just very convoluted. So you, your colon's just, the reason we recommend colonoscopies is because normal imaging is not good at looking at your colon because as you can imagine, your colon's very, um, very stringy for lack of a better word. Tortuous colon is just like tortuous in terms of the colon, typically benign. However, if you're having tortuous colon with many symptoms like constipation or diarrhea, having uh, blood in your stool, dark stool, anything like that, then yes, you, uh, any alarming symptoms like that, then you'll need a colonoscopy. Typically it's non-dangerous. Great, thank you. And next question, does ulcerative colitis increase risk of cancer? And if so, um, what is the percentage if you have that? Ulcerative colitis, is that right? Yes. Yes, ulcerative colitis is one of the inflammatory diseases that can increase your risk for colon cancer. Um, that's one of the um, one of the things that we talked about in the in the lectures. Inflammatory bowel disease, they're called. Um, I can't tell you a percentage, but I can look that up and get back to you about that. Great, thank you. And then, um, do you have any recommendations for um, doctors to get your first colonoscopy from in the area? Um, depending on UC Health versus Rocky Mountain, um, there's many good ones. Shelby might be able to help with that too. Um, but we have a GI group of gastroenterologists in our building in UC Health. Um, his name is Dr. Mengshul and his partner, Dr. Austin. I think they all do colonoscopies. There's also wonderful doctors with Rocky Mountain um, Cancer Center. Uh, there's a certain Dr. Evans, Luke Evans, that I refer to. So there's that. Depending on your insurance, there's, there's a few we can recommend. Yeah, this is Shelby. Um, yeah, Rocky Mountain GI is located about two miles south of Highlands Ranch Hospital. Um, and then South Denver GI is another group. They have a clinic located at Sky Ridge Medical Center. So those are a couple options. Great, thank you both. Um, next question, does diverticulitis increase the risk of colon cancer? Diverticulitis? Um, it's not an inflammatory condition. Diverticulitis can be benign. Um, it's very low risk for turning into colon cancer, but it's increased risk than like a normal colon, but very low risk. But if you have diver active diverticulitis, like if you have active diverticulitis, you cannot get a colonoscopy because you can perforate the colon. So you need to have complete healing of the um, colon before you can get a colonoscopy. But if you have active diverticulitis, do not get a colonoscopy. After it heals, you definitely should get a colonoscopy because there is an increased risk. Great, thank you. And then in your opinion of probiotics is helping decrease um, the risk of cancer. So does probiotics help? That's a great, great question. Um, so good colon health is very important in preventing cancer. If you're having good bowel movements and having good colon health, that really helps. But do probiotics really help prevent colon cancer? We don't have great data to recommend probiotics for cancer prevention, unfortunately. 
But people ask me all the time what the best probiotics are. Honestly, we don't have a favorite. Like the best, when we talk to our pharmacists, they tell us that the best probiotics are in yogurt. So if you can eat yogurt, a cup of yogurt a day, that's the best probiotics you can get. Um, but yeah, good. it does promote good colon health. So I do um, think that you should take some probiotics. Great, thank you. And do most insurances cover the cost of a colonoscopy? Yes, yes, they should. Um, they should cover that for sure. All right, so I believe that's everything. Oh, one more, a few more questions popped in. <laughs> um, so the question is, um, our person is age 70, no risk factors, no history of colon cancer, no polyps, clear colonoscopies every time. Should she still continue to get colonoscopies regularly? So if your last colonoscopy, so if your last colonoscopy was at 65, your next one should be at 75 and that should be your last one. If you've never had any polyps, never had any issues because we want to screen you until you hit 75. Um, so yeah. Great, thank you. And next question, I've been told that usually it's best not to do a colonoscopy after age 80, is that true? Yes, totally. So our average risk patients, right? Average risk meaning um, you don't have any high risk uh, for like a family history of colon cancer, have not had a prior um, colonic cancer or rectal cancer. Average risk patients, typically um, we stop screening at 75 if your prior colonoscopies have all been good. If you're 80 and um, have had normal colonoscopies up until then, um, the risk benefit ratio, we uh, don't think that a, a colonoscopy is beneficial at that point. Great, thank you. Um, does UC Health have GI clinics in Colorado Springs? Oh gosh, I am not sure. Shelby, do you know? Uh, I'm sure they do, but if you give me a minute, I will try to find it on the internet. So just give me a minute. Awesome, thank you. And while we're looking into that, um, next question. What do you think about alternatives for colonoscopies? So, if for some reason you're not able to get a colonoscopy um, because of the bowel prep is too hard, um, et cetera, the next best test based on the sensitivities is the DNA test. Um, the Polgar testing is good. So based on that, you're able to get other testing. Um, so only thing is if those are abnormal, if a colagard is abnormal or a fit testing, which is a stool based sample that we check for blood in it, those are abnormal, you'll end up getting a colonoscopy anyway. And um, the colonoscopies are every 10 years if they're negative, but if a colagard is negative, you have to do it again in three years. But fit testing is negative, you have to do it every year, um, even if it's negative. So it's more often, um, However, we do them, we do do them because some people don't wanna get a colonoscopy, don't wanna deal with the bowel prep. Um, so yeah, but our favorite, or we prefer, our preferred a way to screen is through a colonoscopy. Uh, if, you do, if you see a polyp there, we can just remove it and send it off for testing. Um, it's, yeah, it can be cumbersome though. So we understand that not everybody wants to do that bowel prep, which is uh, pre pretty bad. Um, yeah. Awesome. Great. Shelby, have you found anything? Otherwise, we'll go on to the next question while you're still looking into it. You can keep, uh, keep going. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so the next one is, um, I had rectal cancer diagnosed about three years ago, had chemo and 30 radiation treatments. I had CDF in July, August of 2021, and again at the end of January 2022. The cramping was difficult and I'm cramping every day still. Did the radiation treatments, all 30 of them, and now having IBSD, did that radiation damage my colon? It's hard to say what did that. So when we do chemotherapy with radiation, you can have some inflammation and some scarring there it can make you more prone to infections because we do um, quite a number with all the radiation can scar your um, anus and rectal area, as well as your chemotherapy is systemic. So every organ gets affected when we do chemotherapy. So you can have some residual effects from that. You, you can be more prone to infections because of that. So it's hard to say whether 
radiation directly correlates with you getting um, IBSC, but com a combination of everything that you've been through probably um, caused it. And there's other reasons why you, you can get IBSD as well, like environment, like you can, you can just get it over time. Um, idiopathic, we call it, there's no great reason. Um, so yeah, it could have, I mean, radiation can definitely, definitely cause, but radiation is typically localized um, where to where you're, if you have rectal cancer or anal cancer, we're able to um, give it to that area. So typically it doesn't cause any systemic issues. Um, but, you know, since your colon is right there next to your rectum, you can have some, um, some symptoms from radiation that are long lasting. Great, thank you. Well, it looks like that's all the questions we had this evening. Um, Shelby, have you found anything? Otherwise we can write it in the chat. Yeah, Hannah, I will, uh, I'll put an email together. Um, I don't think UC Health has its own GI clinic in Colorado Springs, but it partners with community doctors. So I can put that in an email if you want to send it out. Great. Thank you. Yes, I will send that out then after within the next day or two, along with the recording of the webinar tonight. So that's awesome. Well, great. Thank you um, for attending. Thanks again to, for UCL, UC Health for giving us this opportunity to learn more about colon health. Thank you for all of those who joined. Um, our next virtual health event will be on Wednesday, April 6th on screenings, when to get and when to get them. Thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your night. Thank you.